Chris and Chris Talk Movies. Hello, welcome back to the podcast. My name is Chris Ferry. This is my co-host. My name is Chris Huddleston. And today we are both very excited to be talking to you about the 1998 horror science fiction film, uh, Robert Rodriguez film, The Faculty. No more pencils, no more books. No more teachers, dirty looks. The students at Harrington High have always suspected their teachers were from another planet. Is this going to be on the test? This is the test. This time, they're right. Now, these six students won't just question authority. They'll have to destroy it. Critics are calling it hip and scary. A thrilling ride from beginning to end. The faculty. Please report to the principal's office. <laughs> do you have a synopsis for us, Mr. Huddleston? I do. As you said, uh, this is a 1998 film directed by Robert Rodriguez. And I'm going to just do a quick rundown of the cast list because this may be the craziest cast of any film that we've done. On let's say show. do the synopsis and let's save it because I really want to take our time with this cast list. It just okay. gets crazier and crazier. OK, so that when I do the synopsis, I'll leave the cast names out. Yeah. Uh, to the students of Harrington High, the principal and her posse of teachers have always been a little odd, but lately they've been behaving positively alien. Controlled by otherworldly parasites, the faculty try to infect students one by one. Uh, cheerleader, football player, drug dealer, and new girl, uh, Mary Beth, uh, team up with some of their other classmates to fight back against the invaders. So I had seen this before at when it came out on video, so like 98 or 99. I don't know if I'd watched it since then, but you had not previously watched it. And I should say... Uh, if you have the HBO Max, this is on HBO Max. It's or on you can HBO, and I'm going to tip my hand. It's a great watch. Uh, you should just treat yourself. So there's there's many things that delightfully blindsided me about this. I was vaguely aware of it when it came out. It came out in 98, which was right when I was in um, grad school. Uh, so I, I didn't, I didn't have a ton of free time, uh, on my weekends. I went to see movies, but you know, I like the matrix came out when I was living out in San Francisco and I went a to year see later, that. but it wasn't a thing. It, it wasn't a thing. I didn't just go see every single movie that came out. I saw a movie here and there. So I was aware of this, but. I didn't really know anything about it. I knew it was a high school movie and it was a science fiction horror thing. I also, at that time in my life, wasn't super aware of Robert Rodriguez. I think I was aware of the Mari El Mariachi, um, but I hadn't gotten into, into film, like into, into film the way that I feel like I have recently since then. So I didn't realize this was a Robert Rodriguez movie. I didn't, I didn't know anything about the people that were in it. I didn't, I figured, I, I think I knew it was a kind of a campy aliens in a high school horror, you know, thing. So I start watching it and, and I, I, we, we can share this cast list because it's just crazy. But the first thing that strikes you is you're like, oh my God, you know, so, oh, there's BB Newworth. Crazy. Um, I've got a story about BB Newworth that I'll share with okay. you in a little bit, but you know, the, there was a this was a sort of a time when BB Newworth was doing movies, um, and uh, and so you're oh oh cool Daniel von Bargen's in this another great character actor who if if you don't know the name you would absolutely recognize him and he's in everything, and then a little bit down the road not, this is not really in the order you see them Christopher McDonald is in it another great character actor from the eighties and nineties that was in everything for a hot minute there. Selma Hayek is in it. You're like that, that school nurse is Selma Hayek playing a school right? nurse. Yeah. I, I haven't even gotten started yet. I haven't mm -hmm. even gotten started yet. Right. So 
We're going to get to the kids because obviously there's a there's it's this kind of rogues gallery of the high school. You know, there's the head cheerleader and the captain of the football team and the the nerdy. You know, he works for the school newspaper and he, everybody picks on him and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The big archetypes. Right. But we start meeting the team. Robert Patrick is in it. Right. From T2. He's this he's the T2 Terminator. He's the hard ass a football coach. And he's great. He's great. Yes. Everybody in this is great. Everybody's Everybody great. in this is great. And then you'd recognize some other, like Piper Laurie is in it that you probably may not know her name, but you'll recognize her face. And everybody's terrific, right? Uh, John Stewart is the biology teacher. John Stewart. And you know what was great? So John Stewart at this time was not John Stewart. Right. I probably knew John Stewart best from, he had a talk show on MTV, you know, in like, the mid or early 90s right, so it was, it was like, called the john oh, stewart show i think yeah, yeah. yeah yeah and it was like oh it's john stewart way yeah. way before uh the daily show indeed you know? indeed and so it keeps getting better and I, again i haven't even gotten to the kids yet right so and then we meet the um eventually we meet the kind of awkward nerdy english teacher it's famke jensen <laughs> <laughs> with glasses and bad bangs and you go okay i mean you see this coming like mm -hmm. at some point something's gonna happen and she's gonna be the hot she's once the Jensen. aliens take over I am, hot, so, you know. so this movie is all about telegraphing all of the it, it is robert rodriguez to a t it's paint by numbers it's everything you expect and then it just twists it in delightful ways every step of the way to give you to your cake and eat it too. Uh, you get to, you get to have your expectations met and then you get all these great kind of sexy, silly, gross, um, you know, jump scare surprises throughout. Um, so, so these are just the teachers, right? And th there's going to be a couple of other teachers that you probably recognize um, that, that, uh, whose name might not chime the way they don't chime with me, but the kids are. So the captain of the Josh Hartnett is in this. He is not the captain of the football team. He is, um, he's a very difficult to describe character. He's the kind of stoner bad boy, but he is also sort of a closet genius. Like, yeah. Would you just say he's the wild card? I don't know. I don't yeah. know what you'd call this guy. Yeah. He, at first he's the sort of, um, he's the burnout. That's, that's what, that's, that's what we meet him at first. And he has got the silliest haircut that I, would, I I can only describe as 50% Dr. Uh, Mr. Spock and 50% uh, Dumb and Dumber. <laughs> like it's, and it's like a bedhead. You it's know, it's just like he, because it's like sticking up in the back. And it's like a bowl cut that's greasy and plastered to his head and front and sticking up in the back with these kind of Dr. Spock sideburns. I, I don't know. I don't know who. I don't know how that happened, but it's and I don't remember crazy. this being like a style in 1998 or anything. No. I don't remember other no, no. people having the hairdo. And then you've got um Clea or Clea, I don't know how you pronounce her name, Duvall, who mm -hmm. I, I'm not super uh aware of her filmography, but I definitely recognize her from other she stuff. She was in stuff at the time, you know. I think yes. she was a little bit in it, you know. And it she's person. this she's the sort of I mean, they they keep accusing her of being a lesbian i mean that you know these kids are really cruel to each other um jordana brewster is the is the um is the high school cheerleader um she looks familiar to me but i don't know much about uh, much else about what she's been in she was now i've not watched these films but because uh, they're just not my thing but she got into the fast and the furious stuff i think she was in oh the early ones and then maybe later. So that was, I think that's her big, you know, kind of claim to fame. And she does a great job in this. She is a bitch on rails. I mean, mm -hmm. she is so mean in this movie and, but she's not, you'd expect this sort of uh cookie cutter blonde uh, type. She's not that at all. So it's sort of a surprise casting, although she does a fantastic job in it. Um, I'm not sure how you pronounce his last name. Sean, is it Hatosi or Hatosi? I, well, I'm not I'm sure not either. Sure. You'd recognize him, although I don't know his film. He also he does, was in stuff then, you know. Yeah, he does a decent job. Danny Masterson of that 70s show is is one of these sort of um, peripheral characters. Usher. Usher. 
is another guy <laughs> on the football team. Um, and then, of course, Frodo Baggins, right? Elijah Wood is the nerdy pre Frodo Baggins, right? Because that, that was way pre or four yeah, or something. Pre, yeah, I guess not way pre, but definitely pre Frodo, um, who ends up being the sort of underdog. And then um, the um, uh, Laura Harris is the new student. And she, I definitely recognized her, too, although I can't I can't speak to her filmography, but it's like just watching this movie scene for scene to see who else pops up up in it was so delightful to me um you know you'd walk around the corner and you're in the teacher's lounge you're, oh my god they're in it john stewart i mean it was mm -hmm. just this i was texting you a flurry of texts i was so excited to see all all the different all the different faces um anyway i'm, I'm blathering on uh you talk for a little while, what, you know. Yeah, I had. What do you love so, about? I mean, I'm going to reiterate a lot of the things that you said. Uh, and yeah, I had for like I remembered Fomke Jansen and uh, Jordana Brewster and um, uh, Josh Hartnett and I, you know Elijah Wood and all that. But I like I had completely forgotten about BB Newworth and Selma Hayek and you know some of these and and it's this even though I had seen this before it was the same thing it was like oh wow you know it's that person and I texted you early in this um uh, like I'm 10 minutes into it or whatever and the principal is BB Newworth and it's it, I'm sure I brought this up on other episodes but it's fun to go back and watch I mean I was an adult when this when this movie came about out but I was in my 20s uh you you know we were in our 20s but B.B. Newworth, basically, I knew from Cheers, right, where she was this kind of, you know, robotic wife to Frasier, you know, and um, but it's funny to look at these things with, you know, adult older eyes, because I I remembered I was like, oh, Fomke Jansen is in this. Jordana Brewster is in this. But I'm watching this thinking B.B. Newworth. Like she's maybe the hottest, you know, actor, actress she's great. in this book. She's gorgeous in this. And I was just like, wow, I never knew, you know, not that she wasn't an attractive woman or anything, but it was one of those things where just like as a kid, I didn't realize, you know, uh, and she's terrific. I mean, that's the other great. thing is I think that, you know, she's had a, she's a dancer and a Broadway star for a long time. And film was the sort of a, a later, uh, thing in her career and interestingly if this was 98 uh i was in a play with bb newworth um i danced a tango with bb newworth or i, I should say bb newworth who weighs about a hundred pounds soaking mm -hmm. wet i mean tiny it's like she's built out of steel cable carried me through a tango that i was <laughs> supposed to be leading so not only did she make it look like A, I could dance, and B, I was leading in this complicated tango, but she literally just carried me through it because <laughs> I I'm not a very good dancer. Uh, I was an understudy of McKeith in the Three Penny Opera, and the guy playing it got sick one night, and I went on. And, cool. And this was in San Francisco. Yeah, this was just this was our senior year, year I think of grad school, so this would have been like uh, ninety nine, a year after wow. the movie came up, but. Um, she's really cool. That's awesome. Yeah, and she's a it's real nice to hear that. You know, you don't mess with BB Newworth, man. She doesn't uh. take any guff. <laughs> um, but she's a lot like the character she plays in this. You know, there okay. she's always got a twinkle in her eye, mm -hmm. and uh, she doesn't suffer fools gladly. Uh, and she is intensely sexy in that way. In the in yeah. that with that confidence and and a little hint of cruelty to it mm. too, like. You don't want to show a bunch of weakness. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She'll get you. Uh, <laughs> she she was really a firecracker. So um, it's, so that was fun to see uh, her in this film from the time period when I got to meet her. Um, yeah, I just, I'm sorry, I'm I'm blathering again. Oh, no, I no. really, really enjoyed this film. I thought it was, um, I, I like Robert Rodriguez's work. I like the Spy Kids films. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, El Mariachi is a classic, but, um, but this was terrific. I, I, I don't think I'd ever seen him do like this particular genre before. Does he do a lot of horror? I mean, El Mariachi's bloody. Well, 
have you seen and this is one if you haven't seen we should do for the show have you seen grindhouse i don't so gr grindhouse don't so. is a was a it sort of flopped but it was a um a project that robert rodriguez and quentin tarantino did together oh that's and, why it chimes yeah i remember and, this now they did it was a double feature so i went to see it in the theater so they did a double feature with fake trailers in the middle and the fake trailers are fantastic but so robert rodriguez's part was um called planet terror uh which is a zombie kind of a thing it's really fun and then um quentin tarantino's is called death proof uh with um is there a woman uh, in Death Proof that has like a gun for a leg? That's in that's in Planet Terror. That's in the Planet Terror part. <laughs> so this yeah. is coming back to me. I don't we think should. I've seen it. I think I've maybe seen. I've maybe YouTubed or Googled up those middle trailers. The trailers I, I've are sort awesome. of you know I'm aware of it, but I don't think I sat down and ever watched it start to finish. We, we should, should do it because it's do it so next. much. Yeah, let's do it next. It's so much fun, and. People view the, the Quentin Tarantino part, people tend to view as like lesser Tarantino, but it's, I mean, it's Tarantino, so it's still entertaining. But uh, he also did um, Sin City. Have you seen Sin City? I have seen Sin City, yes. Yeah. So, Although I don't think of that. It's not horror. I mean, yeah, it's a comic book thing. Yeah, it's a comic book thing. And I get it. I didn't, I mean, I appreciate it. It didn't. It felt because it's so stylized. It felt more like an exercise in style to me mm -hmm. than it did a movie. And I don't think that this film succumbs to that. I mean, this is very much honoring the tropes that you would expect from a high school horror thing, right? It's all of the paint by number archetypes and, um, it's the right blend of sexy and scary and gross and jump scary. Um, but he does bring that irreverence to it and he manages to find ways to make things feel surprising within those cliches. Mm -hmm. uh, so I really, I, I really, I really thought it was hugely successful. I, I admit that part of it is a nostalgia thing for me because um, it's fun. It's like looking through a bunch of old pictures. Your friends show up with like from college and like, oh, you remember we had this pair? Like, oh, yeah. And then, you know, so there's this seeing all these faces like Daniel Von Bargen is dead now. And I think and he, he was just in so many I think things. He's dead. I'm pretty sure he's dead. Um, but I just, you know, a lot of time's gone by. It's been 25 years. Yeah. And uh, there's Elijah Wood, you know, all these Josh, they're all grown up now. And they're <laughs> and it's just crazy how successful so many of these people uh, are. You know, yeah. Elijah Wood can do anything he wants to do, basically. And he just does because he it, made a fortune with. Even if know, that includes like literally doing nothing like you yeah. made it, man. <laughs> but he just does whatever, whatever movies yeah. he wants to make yeah. and he produces movies and he has a record label and all this kind of stuff. You know, he has kind of like a dream life, but Fomke Jansen went on to the X-Men movies. Um, uh, John, and we've talked about John, John Stewart is John Stewart now, you know, and he was just, you know, say just an actor, but he was just an actor, you know, at this time. Um, so that that's fun. And I think, you know, you say, uh, that they're high school tropes they are definitely but this is a pretty smart script because these kids are all smart you know none of them are even the 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 jock football player who's supposed to be dumb and the bitchy girlfriend treats him like an idiot because he says he doesn't want to play football anymore he wants to go to school based on you know his intellect and she's like oh yeah right you know but he's He's not dumb, you know. The stoner guy, like you said, is a, is pretty much a genius. So it's, you know, these. I I think they're just they're just pretty well drawn out teenage characters, you know. They they are, they are. We meet them in these broad primary colors, and then they immediately begin to get more interesting and human as we go. So they do conform to their things, but, but the, 
Rodriguez immediately, he's cast great folks and he immediately lets these characters start bleeding outside of those rigidly drawn cliched lines. Um, and I mean, he, so, so here's an example. First of all, we spoil all these movies. If you haven't already gotten that, if you're just listening to us for the first time and I've already spoiled a bunch of stuff, I apologize, but, um, we do. And I'm going to keep doing it. There's a wonderful scene where they discover that this kind of I forget what they call it. He's not he's not cooking meth in his basement, the Josh Hartnett character, but he's cooking down like caffeine pills and cough syrup. I mean, he's made some kind of a cocaine looking powder that he stores in uh, puts them in big pens, big, the big pen case. So like you yeah. pull the the center out of a big pan and he fills them up and sells them to people for five bucks a piece or whatever. And it jacks them up for a while. They discover that because there's so much caffeine and it, it's dehydrating and that kills the aliens. Mm -hmm. So, and then they're, they're all down in his basement trying to figure out what to do next. And they realize that one of them could be an alien and they can't necessarily trust each other. So we've seen this scene before, where, you know, everybody, well, what about you? Every each, you know, it's a murder on the Orient Express. Everyone's got a motive. It could be any, any of us. Right. And they all start to turn on each other and they discover, they decide that the only way to prove that they're not an alien is to do this drug. Mm -hmm. So you could see how this plays out. Right. So they're all going to do this drug. You know, you don't, one of them has to be an alien, right. Or this scene is not any fun. And it's going to be the last one that we get to, and everybody else is going to be high. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's a spin so, on the the scene for the blood scene from the thing. It's you know. so yeah, it's so great because it just deftly paints itself into this corner where you're going to have a basement full of high high school kids, <laughs> and the one that has been pretending that is an alien that has been pretending to be a kid, and it plays out, and you think, oh, this is going to be great, and it is. It's great. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know how they're going to get out of this one, but, <laughs> and I think he does that again and again. He, he really, you know, there's, there's a scene where the football team is all infected and they're chasing Elijah Wood and he gets into one of the school buses in the parking lot and you go, Oh man, don't go in there. Like there's no way out. They're going to mm -hmm. surround the bus. There's a hundred of them. And, and of course they get in the bus and they're, and they bust in the back. So they're coming at him from both ways. And, he squeaks out in a way that you don't see coming, but then seems obvious afterwards. And it's like the whole movie pulls those hat tricks again and again, where it feels like he's reinventing the wheel. It's not mm -hmm. like this movie is, is particularly original. And that's exactly the point. It's like, yeah. oh, you want, you like Wrigley's spearmint gum. Okay. Well, I made you some Wrigley spearmint gum but it's never boring. And I, I think it's seldom is it very predictable. No. But you go, oh, so he's done this totally new thing. You're like, no, no, it's very much a stick of Wrigley Spearmint gum. But I haven't enjoyed Wrigley Spearmint gum that much in a long <laughs> time. You know, yeah. I just, I don't know where I get that metaphor, but. That's a good one. I like it. But it it really is. It, it, you get your cake and you eat it too, because it's, it, it's this kind of pat formula but he breathes new life into it from almost every direction. I just, I thought it was super fun. It didn't change my life. I didn't walk no. away learning a valuable lesson, but man, was it fun. <laughs> well, Kevin Smith, or not Kevin Smith, Kevin Williamson was one of, there were three screenwriters credited on this and he's one of the screenwriters and he wrote Scream, which is famous for being this meta horror thing. And so you have a lot of meta stuff in this and, you know, they very early on acknowledge that they're not reinventing the wheel. Cause there's a really great scene where the new girl is talking to, um, was, what is it? Clea Duvall. And, uh, she's reading a book and she's like, what are you reading? And it's Robert Heinlein's something. I forget what the title is. And, uh, she's like, yeah, the, you know, um, uh, invasion of the body snatchers was a ripoff of this or, or something like that. So they're, you know, right off the bat, they're, they're referencing invasion of the body snatchers, which is what this is. You know, it makes uh, me, it makes me think of the comedian that tells you the punchline, you know, 
and before they tell you the joke. They're like, okay, I'm going to give you the punchline. <laughs> All right? So you know where it's going. And then they spin the joke, and then it comes back around to the punchline, and you get a big laugh. I mean, that's what this film does is it shows you exactly the hand that it's playing with, and then it still beats you. But and and it's not like oh we're just going to remake Invasion of the Body Snatchers. We're going to take you know Invasion of the Body Snatchers and the Thing and some other movies and just kind of put them in a blender and make it a teenage uh, story. Yeah, and it just it all works really. And there's a there's a little bit of skin, not very much. They suggest it more than anything else. There's one kiss. That's kind of exciting. You know, there's just a little bit of everything. There's one gross thing where someone's skin kind of sloughs off. There's another place where someone kind of gets a handful of their hair yanked out. And you're like, oh, um, there is some CGI that I think is OK done. You know, that it's fine, especially for 98. Um, it's not one single thing. It's not. You know, there's a little bit of body horror in there. Um, there's an eye gouging, some fingers get cut off, you know, so there's enough of that to definitely satisfy the horror thing for sure, mm -hmm. but it's not bathed in gore. No. And it's fun, fun, you know, yeah. gore. Yes. And there's some good squeals and, you know, the guy that's chasing you, you look up, you, you, you lose him and you look up and there he is at the end of the hallway and he starts running towards you. So all of these tropes that you get. Um, there they are. They're all in there. And it's like, well, how do you make a cake out of all of the, you know, these different recipes and have it come out feeling distinct and not just this muddy mess, but it, it really, it really does. It uses a little bit of everything and it manages to be not only successful, but I think really stand out as like, I'm trying to think of another movie of this genre that I enjoyed more than this. Yeah. I can't, yeah. I can't really. Um, and oh, so, uh, now this is major spoiler. So if you, if you want to watch this movie and, and be surprised, just skip over, you know, don't listen to this part and come back later. Uh, so this is your warning. Did you guess who the alien was? I, I started to get an inkling, um, when they were in the basement okay trying to figure it out because i was pretty sure that the head cheerleader was infected but we know from the beginning of the movie like if you're paying attention the first real bad the first real bad guy you see is um is the coach mm -hmm. but and for a while they think oh he's the they're trying to figure out ground zero they're trying to figure out what the queen organism is Right. So first of all, they keep calling it the queen and you're like, well, it's it could be the queen in uh, the coach's body, but I doubt it. And we see someone come walk up to the coach and just a shadow fall across him. He looks up, and he's like, yes. And then the next time we see him, he's infected. So we're pretty sure from the very get go, it isn't him. Somebody mm -hmm. infected him. We do find out that there's a one of the teachers that we wouldn't have expected early on to be infected actually is. So you think, well, maybe it was her, you know, maybe it was her, but I don't know. It never, you think, well, maybe it's the head cheerleaders, but you're know, like, it's too early in the movie for that to be the thing. So I'm like, the only other person that really leaves is who it ends up being. I guess, are we saying who it is? Yeah. Yeah. The new girl, right? Right. Who literally shows up and they point that out that everybody's got this sort of Achilles heel. And they're like, well, what about you? You literally showed up at school. The day this all started, you know, she's like, well, I can't help, you know, <laughs> you know, and I think that's, a, cool. I, I think that's such a fun thing. And and I'm, you know, I'm trying to remember back 25 years, but I don't think I, I, I think I was surprised. I don't think I predicted her, but I, I think it's a neat, that's also a nod to, uh, the previous versions of invade, invasion of the body snatchers where you have, um, where, you know, it's always the fear of the other. Um, you have uh, the 50s 
Invasion of the Body Snatchers that's about communism. And then the second one, I think, is the, the 70s one, I think, is, is more about conformity, you know. Um, but in this, you have, it's literally like, oh, you can't trust the new person, you know. And uh, I, I just think that's a neat, you know, nod to that, how that story has been told in the past. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, it's really successful. I, I can't believe I haven't seen this before, actually. I, you know, even in 98, it really wasn't my thing. Like, I've gotten so much more into horror as a genre. I've always been into sci-fi. Mm -hmm. But I think this red is more of a campy horror thing. There's a lot of horror that wears a kind of a sci-fi costume. Oh, yeah. You know, it's set in space or it, you know, they've come to the planet. And I am interested in those films. But the horror is frequently kind of a turnoff for me. And the exceptions would be things, movies like The Thing and, you know, mm -hmm. Carpenter's The Thing. And, but in general, you know, I like kind of pure sci-fi and was never all that attracted to horror. And doing this podcast with you over the past three years, um, I've really gotten more into it. And I think a lot of that is like, you know my yeah. vibe. And we try and serve each other up things that we think the other person's going to like. And so being able to trust your recommendations is really being like, oh, that that actually was a lot of fun, you know? Yeah. And that's what's so fun to me is when I, you know, when th there's one of these that I think you're, you know, I would have been really surprised if you were just like, oh, I didn't like this movie. It's yeah. terrible. Not for me. You know? And, you know, we've talked about this before, but I've, you know, I've always been more into horror than what you are, but I don't want to see people just tortured and, you know, right. uh, beaten to death and all that kind of stuff. It's funny because I was talking with uh, somebody about this the other day. What I have always had a hard time with is, you know, people who aren't into horror and they think horror people are like these sadistic people that, you know, love violence or whatever. But what I've always had a hard time with is like Scorsese movies and that kind of stuff where it's just that real life violence where it's just, these terrible people that are, you know, like Joe Pesci snaps and just starts kicking somebody to death or closing. You know what I mean? Yeah. I've always had, and, and I know it's a little bit, it's a, it's a fine line, you know, uh, violence is violence to a degree, I guess, but you know, and I, I knew people like in, I remember in college watching Goodfellas with some, some friends and they would just crack up laughing at those scenes. And I would just be like, this isn't funny. Like seeing somebody's head smashed in or whatever, like in that where it's real, these are real people. You know what I mean? And, I, do, uh, I don't, I don't find it funny. I mean, I think if yeah. you're laughing with delight at Scorsese, there's something. Yeah, they would just be like, oh, this is, yeah. But, funny. Not, but, but the Scorsese and the gangster stuff does not tend to bother me as much as it bothers you. It's just, I think mean, yeah. it's a flavor. Like, how do you like your catharsis? Um, right. And, and I used to have, I've, I've since gone back and appreciated this more, but I even had a hard time in the nineties with, um, Tarantino. Like I, like, uh, uh, Pulp Fiction and Reservoir Dogs, those movies bothered me. And he kind of moved away from that. Like directors, other directors at the time try to kind of were copying that violence, I think, but they didn't have the skill that he did, you know? And, and like I say, I've gone back and I appreciate those movies more because I really liked, um, I think kind of what made me a Tarantino fan was Kill Bill, which those are really violent, you know, but it's yeah. stylized violence, you know? um so i don't know i'm rambling here but i yeah i definitely think um you know our 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 tastes as far as horror are a lot closer than what maybe we would have thought when we started this um because this is what i like is this fun stuff and, and sci-fi and horror mixed together you know i mean those are some of my favorite you know the thing is i think one of my favorite movies of all time you know and you get into the alien movies and that kind of stuff you know yeah it's i think if i had my druthers i could leave the horror out of it all together personally mm -hmm. i i love sci-fi i love really high concept sci-fi i like thrillers um you know so if there's violence in it 
it's not such a turnoff for me. It's just the, you know, and movies like Alien and that whole franchise. There's a big, big crossover of horror and and sci-fi that uh, in which there. But but give me a Blade Runner any day over. Yeah, sure. And you know, and the thing is incredible, but. I the first time I saw the thing, it was really upsetting. Like mm-hmm. I was like, "Oh my god, oh," you know. And I thought, well, if I could have had that movie without that, like, oh, I don't relish that sensation. Right. I, I, that's part of the ride, and uh, I, I appreciate it. But, uh... and you know, when it comes down to vi, and I, I don't think this is necessarily uncommon, when it comes to blood and gore and stuff like that in movies. I can handle that, but real life, like I cannot watch, um, you know, not, this isn't happening as much now because I don't, I'm not watching really cable TV, but remember when, you know, you used to be flipping through the channels and it would be like a surgery. Like I can't, I can't watch that stuff, Yeah, you know? Yeah. Um, well, there are, there is, there are films who, there are films who there are films that have as their goal, the depiction of the senselessness Mm -hmm. of violence. And I think the, there are some films that, um, that part of the point they're trying to make is this, this doesn't help anyone. This damages everyone involved, right? Mm -hmm. Not just the victim, not just the recipient of impact or whatever, but the person committing it and the very fabric of that person's relationships and the fabric of the relationships of the, of the victim and that, that real violence is, uh, is not sexy or fun. It's, it's destructive on so many levels and it's just banal and awful, awful. And those films tend to like have an unflinching eye at it. They're like, no, no, watch. You wanted to see, the scene where, you know, this guy gets beaten to death, I will show you, you know, and you go, mm-hmm. you make, they make you sick to your stomach and not because, you know, tentacles explode out of them or anything else, just because it's so <laughs> senseless. You just think, oh, that's, it's horrible. Mm-hmm. Even if you dislike, even if you dislike the person who is being beaten, at a certain point, the, some human part of you is like, stop, stop, you know? Yeah. And the movies don't, these movies don't, they, they let you see it. And you just, it's not necessarily even bloody. Sometimes you just think, Oh God, kind of violence like that. It's just sickening, it's sickening. And some of these more fun movies like this, you know, there's some, I don't know if it's, if it's, it's an outlet for people or what we're getting sure. far afield of the film, but no, no, it know, is. I, it's catharsis. It's catharsis. It, it's like, it's fun violence to blow off steam so that you can get that out of your system in a controlled and otherwise harmless way and there are some things that are just cinematic it's like i have no interest in owning a gun but i'll readily admit that guns in movies are cool i don't like smoking i've never been a smoker i don't like to be around cigarette smoke smoking in movies looks cool i don't know why you know uh but I don't know. Like I say, we're way off. Ah, I kind of got. But there is to bring it back to the film. There is a scene in this in which Josh Harnett taps out a fresh cigarette, lights it, takes one drag, and puts it out. I'm like, what? What are you doing? Yeah, you just had an urge for one drag. That is a funny. I don't know a single smoker who has ever done that. Mm -hmm. Every smoker I know smokes as much of the cigarette as possible. You know, sometimes your shift is over, your boss is coming, or the principal's right. Fine. You stub it out, you're trying to hide the fact that you were smoking, but nobody voluntarily wastes the rest of a cigarette. Like, you're addicted to it. You know, you can get as much of your fix as you can. I watched an 80s movie over the weekend called Death Spa that I was texting you about. That's a, I'd never seen before. That's a really, really fun silly 80s movie but there's a scene where the tagline is right the tagline is you'll sweat blood yeah (laughs) there's a scene where the main character he thinks there's a all this stuff is happening at this spa that he owns this gym and he thinks it's cursed or something like that and he goes to the 
professor who is an expert on the occult or whatever. And the professor does exactly the same thing that you're mentioning with Josh Hartnett. He lights a cigarette, takes like one drag and, and puts the cigarette out. So yeah, that's a weird, that's a weird movie, almost a trope at this yeah. point. It's like the so, big rock candy mountain where cigarettes grow in trees. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it sounds like we both would recommend this. Oh yeah. Enthusiastically. And if I'm going to apply my in- entertainment litmus test, I, I give it like full marks. I think this is, I mean, obviously look, if you're not into horror or high school movies or any of these big, obvious broad strokes, it's in the trailer on the poster. It's clear what this movie is. If you're not into it, fine. But if if you think it looks good and your friend or your girlfriend or boyfriend thinks it looks good, it's a great date night movie. Um, it's great. Just watch it with a buddy movie. I, I watched it alone. I thought it was great. I, I recommend it on under almost any circumstances. You like to get high and watch a movie. I think you'd really think this is drink fun. some beers, you know? Yeah, I, I, uh, I loved it. I, I had oh, a great good. time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think, uh, you know, this, it only made $40 million. Huh. Uh, you know, that's in 1998 dollars, but it, it wasn't a big hit or anything. And I think, you know, big genre fans know this film, but I would imagine there's a lot of younger people who, you know, weren't around in 1998 that, um, you know, like this kind of stuff, but have never, maybe never seen this movie. And especially to see like, Oh, Elijah Wood is in this, Yeah, you know, and, and some of these other big stars that I, that I, that they may know. It's old enough that it, it tickles the nostalgia bone. Mm -hmm. Right. But it's actually, I mean, I mean, okay. So yeah, I guess it is 25 years old, but it, it's not like we're watching eighties movies and seventies movies and some early nineties movies you get into the late nineties. I mean, there's not big hair and big shoulder pads and stuff. It feels mm-hmm. very, there's a little grungy vibe. It feels to contemporary it. though. Yeah. It there's the grungy music. Fe- and stuff. Yeah. You know, so it, it sort of walks that line where you're like, Oh, right. I mean, maybe you were in elementary school when this movie came out or, or a little bit younger, but you'll still recognize high school and you'll still yeah. recognize the, the thing so it doesn't feel dated in uh exclusive ways no um well and yeah. it's that it's that body snatcher story right but told in a fun way yeah because particularly you know the 50s one is dark but it's it's the 50s so yeah. it, it comes off a little corny now the seven i don't have you seen the 70s oh yes it, that movie is scary i, I mean i the piss out of me when i, I watched it I, Donald I had, Sutherland, Leonard Nimoy. Yeah, it's so scary. Jeff Goldblum. Yeah, it's <laughs> Jeff uh, Goldblum. It. I. I actually. I had never seen it for for some reason, and about four or five years ago, I watched it for the first time. You know, so I'm <laughs> full grown adult, and I was. It's scary. It's a we, frightening. We film. could do that one too, but it yeah, is yeah. scary. Sometime uh, down the road, yeah, I'll have to that. steal myself for it again because it's. Yeah, it's really scary. It's a great film. So I um, I wanted to say really quickly, a little off the subject, I went to see the new uh, M. Night movie, Knock at the Cabin. Oh, yeah, with uh, uh, Dave Bautista. And... Dave Bautista. Um, and so I'd preface this by saying I'm, I'm a big M. Night fan. I mean, I've a lot of his movies. I've, you know, Signs and The Village and Unbreakable um, and Split, you know, some of these other films. Um old which was his previous film to this one was not great i don't know if you've seen it no uh but i thought um knock at the cabin was really effective i've not read the book it was based on a novel and from what i understand they they made some pretty significant changes but i i I really enjoyed it i i tried to to know as little as possible going into it um and i didn't feel like the trailer spoils a whole lot but Dave Bautista, I just think we've, I don't know how many times I talked about the rock on here and I feel kind of like, you know, picking on the rock or whatever, but I saw, um, somebody's tweet or something like that, that like Dave Bautista is what the rock wants to be or something like that. What and, we you know, want the rock to be, right? what we want the rock yeah. to be. Yeah. And, you know, 
you know, who am I to question the rock? I mean, he's made hundreds of millions of dollars, I'm sure at this point, but Batista has said, I mean, they are different men. They're yeah, they are different individual men. people. So, but Batista has said, I mean, I saw an interview with him recently and he said, I don't care about being a movie star. He said, I just want to make good movies. And, you know, uh, I'm paraphrasing a bit, but, you know, uh, stretch him himself and you know try to and i i thought he i mean i think he's a good actor in general but i i thought I do too. he was good in this i mean he's he's scary in it but also you know he's charismatic and and all the yeah i mean i, I thought all of the i didn't know all of the actors um but i thought all of the performances were good you have a young child who gives a perform a good performance so it's a it's just you know it's another uh M night thriller. Yeah. Know. So that's one. I, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a good movie. One of the things I really like about Dave Bautista, do, do I think he's the best actor working in Hollywood? No, but I think he's a very good actor. Yeah. And he's funny, which you can't say about everyone for sure. And he's got some range, which yeah. I, I am impressed by. And I think there's something about Dave Bautista. I understand that he can, be Drax, like he's jacked. He's a huge, he's a bull of a guy. Um, but he's so big and and so um, you know, swole that it's almost inspirational because he does play roles where that's not the point. I mean, mm -hmm. you the rock tends to play roles where that's the point, right? I'm the big so Black Adam, which I haven't seen, is kind of the natural fruition of like well when are we going to cast this guy as a shazam figure because literally like, he's a god you know that's what he looks like he looks like mm -hmm. this larger than life thing so he should be playing that right and of course dave batista has played those roles and does play those roles but he plays he also just plays men mm -hmm. right who happen to be big men but i think for alternately sized and alternately abled and different looking people and you maybe you're rolling your eyes and you're like look he's ripped and he's big so he's always gonna have parts i'm like okay okay maybe but i would say he's almost freakishly big like he yeah. really does look like he doesn't fit in frame with other characters and yet He's able to do scenes with them in roles that that isn't. He just happens to be the neighbor who's a farmer and is literally three times the size of a normal human. And you forget that. Like he does think like he, you need somebody to pick up that fallen tree. He does, but not because he's some superhero, or whatever, just because he's the guy that happens to be able to do it. I don't know if I'm making my point here, but sure. I, in the same way that Schwarzenegger was a freak uh, when pumping iron came out, people were not into that size big that that was freakish. I don't we don't I don't like mm -hmm. I don't like my men too muscly, as one character some at some point said. Mm -hmm. um, and it sort of changed the paradigm until we've got, you know, um these these superhero movies where you've got actors like Hugh Jackman just transforming their bodies to be um, you know, in that kind of shape, that that's de rigueur now, if you're going to be a leading man in Hollywood, especially if you're going to be in a superhero movie, you need to look like an action figure, mm -hmm. um, which is an enormous amount of, of work and it's hard to sustain. And, and it's an impossible standard for most people to meet. Um, and I, I find it collectively, I find it kind of exhausting. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. I like looking at people who are in great shape. It's sexy, male, female, yeah. whatever. It's it's the human body is beautiful when it's in prime shape. This has, takes it way past that at some points. And I just I I, I like seeing more diverse uh, faces uh, and performances and backgrounds on screen. And I think we are starting to do that slowly and casting characters that your brain wants to put in certain roles as different roles goes into that, that uh, shifting uh, paradigm as well. And I, I like it. Well, and Batista in this film, he, and this isn't giving anything away in in the film basically but he he's part of this group of four people 
who break into this cabin that these people are in and they take them hostage. And, but Batista and the other people think they're doing a good thing. And, you know, like you're talking about with that size, the early on his, his size makes him scary and intimidating, but then he reveals to these people that he's a teacher and he shows, he shows them a picture of his students, you know, and how much he cares about them. And so he's, you know, initially he's, he's scary and he's a monster. Um, yeah. He's a monster, but he, you know, they have this reason for doing what they're doing and he's kind and empathetic and gentle with these people, you know, so it's not just a big brute. Uh, so it's, it's just, I don't know. It's just a really interesting yeah. Yeah. character and interesting performance. So. Well, and Peter Dinklage is another obvious example, right? I mean, yeah. he was a little person, but He's certainly not. He's he's a heavyweight on screen. I mean, Game oh, yeah. of Thrones stole that series. Like, you don't mess with Tyrion Lannister, and he's not going to beat you in a sword fight. Like, it's mm. not about oh, this character can do anything. No, nobody's arguing that. It's just that he can he can be the smartest guy in the room and the most charming and and completely control the narrative. And it's super refreshing. And he has great range. You know, he can be he's scary got, and he can oh, be he's funny. Got, and he's got know. great range. Yeah, he's a yeah. terrific actor. So, um, but I, I feel like there was a time when you wouldn't, you'd say, okay, well maybe Cyrano. Okay. Or maybe Willow or time bandits, but otherwise, uh, best of luck to you, pal. You know, they wouldn't imagine that a person that looked like him physically could play certain roles on film viably. And I think that, you know, he's one example and Batista's sort of another starting to be an example of like, don't open your mind, you know, just give a chance, let him read for it. You know, he might surprise you and it might feel really refreshing in ways that surprise you and the audience will love. Audiences seem to like it. Like, like me, I, audiences aren't rebelling at this. Look at Black Panther. I mean, yeah, people love, I love that movie. It was so great. And well, I think the and studios I, were afraid of like, oh, only black audiences are going to come to this. I'm like, what? Come on, give us a chance. And People just want to see. I think I've told this story before about um, uh, Cal Penn in an interview a few years ago. I heard him talking about uh, Harold and Kumar. And he said they had such a hard time making that film because he said the uh, for the buddy thing, the studios were like, well, one of the people has to be white. And they're like, why? Who, you know, who cares? Right. Right. And they're just like, well, this is basically that's it's how not it works. Been, it's not this is how it works, and it's not been done before. And you know, it's kind of the rest is you know they were able to do it, and kind of the rest of its history. And that just comes down to, um, I, people just don't care. They just want good stories, you know. Right. With Batista, I saw a, just a, a brief like an Instagram or TikTok, uh, video of him and Jared Leto not together, but just separate interviews. And they both said exactly the same thing. Batista was like, you know, they were like, what would you like to do? And he's like, I'd like to do a romantic comedy, but nobody, nobody asked me to do a romantic comedy. And Jared, and they said to Jared Leto, they were like, would you do in a romantic comedy? You know, cause he's kind of this Oscar guy, you know, now. And he's like, yeah, but he's like, they never asked me to they never asked me to do those, you know, so it's kind of funny that, I mean, two very different types, but that's another, uh, that's another genre with a curse on it, the romantic comedy, because there are so many cheesy formulaic, horrible ones, but there are a handful of really great romantic comedies. Like every genre has really great, great you know. romantic comedy is a wonderful thing. It's a great thing to go see with your you know, with your your partner, your date, it's a great thing to watch with your parents, at yeah. the or just you know a really, you know, a really great movie of any genre is a really great movie. Sure, yeah, some of them certainly are bad, but something like like Notting Hill comes to mind. You know, is I think the really bad ones movie. feel like that everybody who made it thought it was going to be easy, and they're all mm -hmm. just kind of phoning it in and painting in the numbers, and you're like. Like that's not how you make a good anything. Right? Yeah. That's not how you make a good movie of any genre. It's certainly not how you make a good romantic comedy. You got to figure out a way to do what Rodriguez did in this movie and reinvent the wheel. Yeah. 
because I think a, I think a romantic comedy does have a very strong formula. Yeah, and that's part of the satisfaction is you have to feel like boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy gets brought girl back, and that it right. really has to hit those marks, or it doesn't feel like a romantic comedy. Yeah. Um, so, and those are pretty those are pretty strict uh, rules, but I think there's still plenty of Notting Hill was great. Yeah. You know? Anyway, I love actually, I think gets a little bit people kind of, I don't know, panned it a bit, but I think love actually is good. The same people I think made it, but yeah, there's, you know, there's some great romantic comedies. Yeah. Serendipity. I don't think I've ever seen Serendipity. Yeah. John Cusack and uh, Kate Beckinsale. I think John Cusack, I think uh, this is more of a teen angst. It's not really romantic comedy, but. uh say anything right oh yeah that was just more of a emo coming of age romance type thing. it wasn't really a romantic comedy it wasn't all that say anything wasn't all that funny right it all kind of bleeds together with me john cusack in the 80s because yeah that's a little more dr- dead and that's everything. a little more drama i think than yeah. than romantic comedy yeah but yeah that's anyway. another thing with oh, sorry, i go would ahead. Oh, I was just going to say 1998. This is another, I feel like a broken record with this, but I looked at the box office because I wanted to see how this did. And it's just crazy to see how much more diverse the box office was then. Yeah. Titanic was the number one movie. Armageddon was second, but you had like, uh, I think the water boy like was in there and they're like the top five and, uh, 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 Oh shoot. What's the what's the the one that started Ben Affleck and Matt Damon's career? Oh, uh, Goodwill Good Hunting. Hunting. Goodwill Hunting was the number 10 movie that year. Box office made like 100 million dollars or something. Can you imagine that in the theater today? It won an Oscar. Yeah, but as a brand new film, like that would just be a streaming movie, you know? It, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's very hard to imagine it's very hard to imagine, but that is the big delineator. It's this was pre-streaming. So mm-hmm. it's recent enough that it still it does tickle the nostalgia thing, but it still feels contemporary. Like it's hard for me to believe that that was 25 years ago. Mm-hmm. If you said this was 15 years ago, I'd have been like, okay. It was 25 years ago, and it was very much pre-streaming in a way that Netflix was still was mailing out DVDs, I think, Mm -hmm. because I remember being a subscriber to Netflix and getting those red envelopes and everybody had a DVD player. Mm -hmm. I don't remember when they first waded into the concept of having a streaming service, but it wasn't that early. I want to say it was more like the mid 2000s and most people just didn't have the bandwidth for it. Yeah. You know, so. But I suppose, you know, we'll, (laughs) I mean, I feel a little bit like this now, but I suppose at some point, you know, we'll be saying back in my day, we We watched movies. Yeah, we're the two old guys. We watched movies where people had conversations, you know, and it's funny with Goodwill Hunting because they said (laughs) literally they, they felt like they just had to make a movie that was cheap. So what was cheap was to just have people talking in rooms. Yeah. You, know? yeah. you didn't have to do any stunts and I saw, or anything. I saw another interview uh, with Damon talking about it. And um, the movie is full of F-bombs. Mm-hmm. There's just, uh, you know, it, it, there's just, they're constantly saying it. And for, as somebody who has made movies, it's just, he's like, oh, we're from this area, Boston. And that's just how you talk. I'm like, well, but that's also how you talk on a movie when you're trying to make something edgy and clip along, you're just fill your brain fills it in with expletives. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you, you know, unless you're, if you're actively trying not to do that, you have to put some thought into it to not use that language as filler. Mm-hmm. And I mean, the thing is rated R anyway, but um, he was like, we couldn't go back and clean it up because we didn't have alternate takes that weren't also full of that language. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't think there's anything in the movie that, other than language, I don't think there's anything in the movie that would rate it an R. It could have been a PG movie or PG-13 for sort of themes, right? Yeah. Not that I think 13-year-olds would have enjoyed Goodwill Hunting. 
Right. Probably not. But. Anyway, so we're going to, for next time, we're going to do Grindhouse, right? Yeah. Robert Rodriguez. We'll have to make sure that it's streaming, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, I hope it is. Um, and uh, and Quentin Tarantino's sort of double feature project. Um, Chris and Chris Talk Movies at gmail.com. That's our handle. We're on the socials. Uh, perhaps you're watching us on YouTube. Perhaps you're listening to us on your favorite podcast app. Thank you so much for joining us. Like and subscribe. Leave a comment, suggestion. We love to hear from you. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I mean, two thumbs up from us on two thumbs way up. Yeah. I knew that this one was fun, but I'd almost forgotten how fun. Yeah, it's. I really had a good time. And I'm thank glad you for recommending it. You're welcome. Um, and so, if unless you have anything else that you would like to add, no, I think that's end, it. All right, then Chris and I will talk to you all next week.